Have you ever wondered why American politics is so funny? 2016 has escalated into laughs, from awkward air kissing to sniffing. <laughs> The Donald's not allergic to kids. He actually signed one, but threatened to reassign a crying baby. Don't worry about that baby. I love babies. A minute later... Actually, I was only kidding. You can get the baby out of here. What's your name? Nay. And then there was the childlike delight in balloons. It seemed like he'd seen balloons for the first time <laughs> in his life. Why this dichotomy of left and right often plays out as nonsense. Nevada. At one rally... Hey, get this thing out of here, will you? Trump attacked his teleprompter. <laughs> he publicly humiliated... Like this stupid mic. His microphone. Stupid mic keeps popping. Remember when Hillary barked into her mic? Oh, 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 oh. And then this happened at a Trump rally. This is something you shouldn't do. What was that? Is that a dog? Uh -oh. <laughs> Nonsense with little to no impact on the material conditions of everyday working people. That's a good question. And, and, and I ask myself that too, why can't I be rich? You look at me, I'm dirty, I work 10, 12 hours a day, I'm gonna take care of my family, at the end, at the end of the week, I'm broke. Have you ever wondered why characters like Donald Trump and other celebrities have become increasingly more attractive compared to career politicians. And on that ballot will be their names and mine. As you probably could have guessed by this moment, I have decided in 2020 to run for president. Get ready to take a deep dive into the corrupt world of politics as we use a Marxist lens to analyze the two political parties and their dialectical effects on the material conditions of the working class. People don't even realize that we're at war right now. We're in a social war, a spiritual war, an economical war. We're supposed to be working together. You know, this is the United States of America. Why do we have it in our brains that they're the only two choices? Because they've made us think that way, and the media makes you think that way, because they don't cover anybody else. Here, on The Social Situation, for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalists. So let me start. A very famous and very effective political leader once responded to his fellow members of his movement who had complained that the mass of people that they were trying to organize was hard to organize and people complained and unhappy but they didn't do anything and decade after decade went by and so he he responded to them and he said you know it's true for decades nothing happens and then in a few weeks decades happen I think we're in a few weeks welcome back to the social situation I'm your host the benefactor. Today I'd like to take a deep dive into our corrupt political system. I'll show you a direct link between the lack of proper representation for working class taxpayers versus the overwhelming representation for the minority business owner class, leading to a stagnation in progress amongst legislation that directly translates into deteriorating living conditions and a dwindling of the middle class. To do this, we must first apply the dialectical analysis on material. If you've watched my previous episodes, I explain the dialectical analysis and how it is a scientific lens which you can use as a tool to analyze and understand aspects of the world. To summarize, in classical philosophy, idealism is the process of analyzing ideas in order to understand the world. It states that to understand the world you must first understand the ideas that come from it. 
Marx was a philosopher. He comes out of a school of thought that believed that ideas were the supreme achievement of human beings. And so the world is really shaped by something prior to the world, namely ideas. So the notion is, sometimes called idealism, that the real world is the product of ideas. And if you want to really understand the real world, go to the ideas that make it what it is. Marx rejected that. For him, the material is just as important as the ideal. In Marxian philosophy, Marx took this one step further. He said that to understand the world, you have to understand the ideas, yes, but you must also understand the material world and the interactions between the two, or the back and forth between ideas and material. Not just how ideas shape our material reality, but also how our material reality shapes our ideas. If you want to see where the material comes from, it's shaped by ideas. But, and here comes his radicalism, it runs the other way too. The ideas don't come from nowhere. They come out of the real world. The ideas we have as people have to do with the real material problems we have as human beings and how we solve them. Where do we get our food? Where do we get our shelter? How do we get protection as little children from the elements, from our parents? All of these real material matters of life and survival are shaping our ideas every bit as much as our ideas shape the reality. Dialectical materialism is the name for a point of view that says, if you want to understand the world, you need to look at how ideas shape the material, but the other way too, and the two have interact, that's the way to see the world. And for that reason, when it came to explaining the problems of capitalism, he never could and never did suggest it's all because of the ideas of people about capitalism. It's the real way human beings uh, make their food, solve their clothing problems, their relationship problems that shape their ideas as much. And he was going to analyze capitalism through that lens of the interaction of ideas and concrete material reality back and forth. Marx uses this scientific lens to objectively understand complex systems by analyzing the interactions between two opposing forces and observing the created changes over time. With this dialectical lens, you can break down and better understand more complex systems, from political economy all the way to science and technology. Before we begin to break down and analyze the political oligarchy within the United States, I must first go over the basics of Marx's labor theory of value and how it relates to exploitation. This exploitation is understood by examining the different kinds of value, such as the surplus value every worker generates with their labor input. Cracking the economic code with the labor theory of value. The labor theory of value, proposed by Karl Marx, suggests that the value of a commodity is determined by the socially necessary labor time required to produce it. According to this theory, the more labor that goes into producing a commodity, the more value it holds. To fully understand this theory, it's important to distinguish between two key concepts, embodied labor and living labor. Embodied labor refers to the past labor that is congealed or embedded in a commodity. It represents the cumulative labor that has gone into the production process, including the raw materials, tools, and machinery used, as well as the labor required to create and maintain them. Think of the hammer needed for the laborer to make that chair. This concept acknowledges that commodities are not solely the product of immediate or living labor, but also encompass the labor that is stored and preserved in them. Kind of like how potential energy can be stored in a system. Just as potential energy, is the stored energy that can be converted into kinetic energy to perform work. Embodied labor represents the cumulative labor that has been invested in the various components of a commodity. This labor is transformed into value during the production process when living labor interacts with the inputs of production. In this sense, labor cannot be created nor destroyed. Like particle physics, labor also follows the principles of conservation of energy. Like energy, Labor can only be transformed from one form to another, from embodied labor to the value it represents. On the other hand, living labor refers to the labor that is currently performed by workers in the production process. It is the direct exertion of human effort and skill in transforming raw materials and utilizing the means of production to create new commodities. Living labor is the active force that adds new value to the inputs and brings the embodied labor to life. 
It is through this labor that the final product is shaped and brought to market. Think of yourself, the human employee, as the living labor that utilizes the hammer to make the chair. The labor theory of value highlights the dialectical relationship between embodied labor and living labor. Embodied labor represents the past accumulation of labor, while living labor represents the present labor input that generates value. These two forms of labor can be seen as potential and kinetic energy. Only when potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy will you get any useful work, from an engineering perspective. The value of a commodity is determined by the combination of these two forms of labor. The socially necessary labor time required to produce a commodity takes into account both the embodied labor already invested in the materials and means of production, as well as the living labor added during the current production process. As you can see, this represents a more scientific approach than the utility theory of value, which is a mainstream theory that suggests value is placed subjectively on personal utility. After all, just try measuring how much pleasure or utility ice cream gives you. The answer to that is subjective compared to asking the question, how much labor was used to make that ice cream? An objective approach at examining the underlying variables, which ultimately leads to a better understanding of prices. When using science to analyze complex systems, you must look at objective variables that can be quantified, not subjective ones left up to personal interpretation. I must emphasize that the labor theory of value is not a theory of prices. It is a theory of value. This theory of value does not operate on the premise of predicting or determining market prices directly. Instead, it provides a framework for understanding the underlying source of value in commodities. Prices in a capitalist economy are influenced by various factors, such as supply and demand, market competition, and subjective valuation. However, the labor theory of value offers insights into the social relations and exploitative nature of capitalist production. It is not used to determine prices, but to resolve paradoxes of traditional economic theories such as the utility theory of value. In the utility theory of value, the value of a commodity is based on the amount of utility that commodity has to the individual. In this utility theory, a paradox arises when considering water as one of the most useful resources on the planet for life and its relatively low market value. In contrast, a diamond has limited utility compared to their high market value. This is the water diamond paradox, and when analyzing things through a Marxist lens, you can successfully resolve this contradiction because if prices are governed more by utility, rather than labor, then water would clearly have more market value than diamonds. By simply quantifying the amount of labor that has been input into a commodity, you can begin to see how labor directly correlates with value, which can then be used to analyze the more complex idea of price. Price represents the amount of money a commodity can be exchanged for in the market, while value refers to the socially necessary labor time required to produce that commodity meaning that the value of a product is determined by the amount of labor put into making it, regardless of its market price. But that value can be useful in determining that price, like a fractal, where one part represents the whole. So does labor, value, and price. By considering these concepts of embodied and living labor, we can grasp the dynamic interplay between the past accumulation of labor and the present labor input. In this context, my theories of incorporating the concept as above so below into the social sciences suggest that there might be a similar underlying pattern or relationship between labor, value, and price at various levels. Therefore, all of creation, from galaxies to planets to elements, all resonate in unison with a collective chord referred to by our ancestors as above so below. This principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomena of the various planes of being and life. By exploring this analogy further, there might be common principles or dynamics to consider that operate at both the macro and micro levels within capitalist systems. This understanding allows for a more comprehensive analysis of the value-forming process and the exploitation of labor within capitalist systems. Just as a fractal pattern repeats itself across different scales, the interaction between labor, value, and price could potentially manifest in similar ways across different levels of socioeconomic organization. A side note here is that Marx's labor theory of value is not original. 
He based his theory of value off of classical economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who were using it to defend capitalism. However, Marx extended and modified their theories in significant ways. Smith and Ricardo believed that the value of an item was determined by the amount of labor put into making it. Marx expanded on this idea by emphasizing the importance of the average amount of time society deems necessary for producing something. Think of baking a cake. If a cake takes an average of one hour to bake, the labor time necessary to produce that cake is one hour. According to Marx's labor theory of value, the value of the cake would be based on that average time. Now, let's say someone invents a new baking technique that cuts the baking time in half. The socially necessary labor time for producing a cake would now be reduced to 30 minutes. As a result, the value of cakes produced using this new technique would be determined based on this reduced labor time. Marx also introduced the concept of surplus value. Surplus value is the difference between the value of the goods or services produced by the workers and the wages they receive. To make money, to come away with more than they threw in. There's no magic here. They haven't overcome the laws of the thermodynamics. They understand that you don't get out more than you put in. Well, what happened? To how? Well, they're not getting out more than they're putting in. What they're getting out is what they put in, the raw materials, the, the workers, the, the technology, and they get out what those things can produce. But what they can produce is more than what they give to their employees as their income. And that more, which they like to call profit, is why they're in business. They want to get that more from this situation, which they do. And that's why they're the employer. That's why they're in the position of deciding when it's profitable to hire someone and when it isn't. That's why capitalism basically holds all of us that are employees hostage. The boss is always in the following relationship to the worker. If you're the boss, you want to get more out of the worker and give him less. And the worker very quickly understands the name of the game for him or her is to get as much out of you as possible and spend the maximum amount of time imaginable in the bathroom. <laughs> Smoking things. This means that workers produce more value than they are paid in wages, and capitalists benefit from this extra value. Marx argued that this creates a conflict between the working class and the capitalists in a capitalist system. That worker is using his labor to increase the value of a commodity by utilizing the hammer to build the chair. The chair can then be sold by the capitalist for more than the cost to make it. The capitalist strives to increase the difference between labor input and the amount of compensation for making the chair. This is called maximizing profits, and it always comes at the expense of the people who are the ones generating the surplus value. This is called a fundamental opposition of interests. It is a bizarre way of organizing production by putting people who don't trust and hate and struggle against each other. And you know what it does? It produces lots of grotesque inefficiency. You know what the word sabotage comes from? The French word. Sabot is a wooden shoe in French. And if a worker was angry at the boss, which he usually is, what he would do is take the sabot and stick it in the machine, messing it up. And that's called sabotage. That's why you have that word, okay? Workers are always doing that kind of thing because they're angry. Bosses know that. In fact, bosses usually assume you're angry at them, even if you are. <laughs> and then they spend a lot of money hiring people like my wife as a psychotherapist to come up with what kind of music to pipe into the workplace <laughs> to distract you from the anger they think you feel. By reaching 75% refinement on Sienna, you have earned for you and your fellow refiners a five-minute music dance experience. Helly, please approach the MDE card. You may choose one genre and one accessory.
The workers generate the surplus value while the capitalist exploits their labor and doesn't actually generate value themselves, reminding us that within every capitalist business is a king or queen. Ironic that we spend so much energy trying to escape feudalism only to install kings within miniature kingdoms. Techno-feudalistic platforms, where the CEO is commander and chief of their own personal sovereign corporal country. Eh. It's America, brother. We don't do kings. Oh, we do. We do. Just call them something else. What we're recommending is finding significant efficiencies by laying off the people at the bottom of the company and paying more to the people at the top. Hey, that's me. Yes. With the money signs? Yes. Yeah, that's, yes. yes. It's yes. me at the top. <laughs> OK. Marx's labor theory of value was not about determining prices. It was part of his larger analysis of capitalism. He used the theory to criticize capitalism by highlighting contradictions that inherently generate inequality and lead to periodic economic crises. Due to the exploitation of workers from capitalists that extract more value than they pay in wages, Smith and Ricardo focused more on efficient markets and the factors that determine value in capitalism. Marx's theory expanded upon the ideas of Smith and Ricardo, providing a critical perspective on capitalist exploitation and the inherent contradictions of the system. He emphasized the concept of surplus value, which highlighted how workers are often paid less than the value they create, leading to their exploitation. In addition to his scientific analysis of capitalism, Marx also called for a revolutionary change in the economic system to address these issues. His ideas aimed to challenge the existing order and create a more equitable society. Unfortunately, his revolutionary ideas often get conflated with his objective analysis of capitalism which is simply analyzing these areas of concern, rather than taking a stance on what should be done about these concerns. Because Karl Marx died before he could finish his work, he emphasized the importance of advocating for workers' rights, but did not provide an exhaustive blueprint for the exact economic structure necessary for transition. However, through his theoretical framework of Marxism, he laid the foundations for a society based on what he called communism, or a cooperative community-based society. This challenged the existing order of capitalism, which exists as an individualist, competition-based society. I'm going to break down some of the terms we use in this show to give you a better foundation of knowledge and understanding of Marxism going forward. Socialism? is the scare word they have hurled at every advance the people have made in the last 20 years. Socialism is what they call the growth of free and independent labor organizations. Socialism is their name for almost anything. It helps all the people. Most socialists begin with a critique of inequality and the premise that this is not just an accident, but something that is essential to the nature of capitalism. And if you want to create more justice, more equality, you're going to have to fundamentally change the system in some way. The problem is that we all too often have socialism for the rich and rugged free enterprise capitalism for the poor. I think about socialism as the vast majority of people who work for a living in a given society, ultimately making decisions about the direction of that society. We believe in democracy. I mean, the problem with the word socialism is that very often it's been equated with what happens in the Soviet Union, which is authoritarianism and totalitarianism. The major socialist experiments for me have been failures, but I would argue that the major examples of capitalist civilizations have been failures too, especially for poor people, especially for black people, indigenous people, and others. Marx differentiated between communism and socialism in this way. In order to get beyond the current capitalist system, he envisioned the concept of a transitional stage known as socialism, which he believed would lead to a communist society or a society without any internal contradictions or class struggles. Socialism differs from a communist society, which is the theoretical utopia that socialist transition leads to. 
The etymology of the word communism comes from the Latin word communis, which translates to common or shared, and is commonly rooted in the word community. This is why we have many different versions of socialism that often differ quite a bit. It is why you cannot simply lump socialism into one large general category. To do this misunderstands the very birth and evolution of socialism, as there are many different theories on how to proceed with the transition into a theoretical scientific utopia. Socialism is what we call an umbrella term. It encompasses a wide array of ideologies, movements, and practices that all aim to achieve a more equitable and just society. All the taming and civilizing of capitalism that we've seen through welfare states, things like the minimum wage, like free education, all of this has come from movements inspired by the socialist vision. These different versions of socialism can range from democratic socialism, which advocates for social ownership of key industries and a strong welfare state. To me, democratic socialism is the value that in a modern, moral, and wealthy society, no person in America should be too poor to live. To libertarian socialism, which rejects a centralized state and emphasizes direct democracy and workers' control of production. For those who are wondering my political ideology, this is what I am. I'm a libertarian socialist. The theoretical utopia of communism has three basic requirements in order to fulfill its purpose as a self-sustaining society without any internal contradictions. A true communist society needs to have no class system. It would have no monetary system, and finally it would have no need for a state. So, it would be a stateless society. These three principles were intended to ensure a society in which economic resources are shared equitably, social classes are abolished, and individuals are able to live harmoniously without the need for a central authority. Imagine waking up in a Star Trek-type utopia, where all your basic medical, education, shelter and food needs are taken care of, where you are truly free to explore the area of contribution to society that aligns with your passions, interests, and abilities without any limitations imposed by social classes, monetary constraints, or the presence of a governing state. A communist society is the theoretical framework for a utopia. Just like socialism, communism is an umbrella term and a communist society often gets confused with a communist state which is a state controlled by a communist party. Since the communist state still operates under a capitalist-dominated system, it often strays far from the original principles laid out by Karl Marx. Instead, authoritarian regimes have historically used socialism as a way to amass excessive control and power for the government, deviating from the intended goals of promoting equality and eliminating social classes. It's important to understand that these distortions of socialism have led to misunderstandings about its true nature and diverted from its original principle. Socialism is death, it's despair, it's starvation. It's like those zombies in those horror movies, it's coming back. For example, in my opinion, USSR socialism was a farce to justify overreaching state power. They may have started out as a worker revolution, but in reality, the immense power obtained by capturing the state needed to ensure the conditions of its own existence. By eliminating the original Marxist goal of giving the workers ownership to the means of production, this ensured the totalitarian power of the new communist state. However, the planned government of the USSR enabled it to industrialize while the rest of the capitalist world was plunged in a Great Depression, a successful model of a planned economy that often gets forgotten about. Where they are, it's because of ambitious government programs. That's why Cuba, an avowedly socialist country under a decades-long embargo, has a lower rate of infant mortality, a higher life expectancy, and a higher rate of literacy than the much wealthier United States. And that's also why the countries with the lowest poverty are places like Denmark and Finland. It's no mystery. No advanced economy has ever achieved low poverty rates without high levels of government social spending. And the fact is, capitalists have always fought against those policies, against progressive taxation, against minimum wages, against social welfare programs, against union bargaining. Poverty has been reduced not by capitalism, but in spite of and against capitalists' opposition. There's a man. Works in a factory. 
One day, the boss gets it in his mind that this man is stealing from him. So, every night at the gate, the guards search his wheelbarrow. But they never find anything. Pat him down. Oh, they do that. Strip him naked. Nothing. So, he's not stealing? Of course he is. Wheelbarrows. Thank you. That's right. He's stealing wheelbarrows. What? My point is, sometimes the answer is so obvious, you can't see it because you're looking too hard. See, we can't leave because we're the future. Not the past. The past can no more become the future than the future can become the past. Okay. Regardless of its atrocities and human rights abuses, to say that we can't learn anything at all from this model is arrogant. After all, they succeeded where capitalism failed, in terms of rapid industrialization and providing basic necessities to a large population that has to be analyzed objectively in order to reverse engineer why it happened and how we can adapt and apply certain aspects of it to other models, while ensuring the protection of individual liberties and human rights to avoid those atrocities atrocities that occurred due to excessive government power. One of the biggest mistakes that people make in America, when you talk about American socialism, is to imagine that you've got to recreate something that happened in another country. Of course, American socialism will be distinct. It will have its, its own characteristics. Going back to Marx's labor theory of value, we can now see how it is intricately tied to his larger analysis of capitalism and its contradictions. He used the theory to expose the exploitative nature of the capitalist system, claiming that it inherently generates inequality and leads to periodic crises. The three main problems with capitalism are as follows. It is unstable. Everywhere capitalism has existed at any point in history, approximately every four to seven years, capitalism has a crash. This translates into lost jobs and lost lives. Capitalism also is inherently undemocratic, and it leads to enormous wealth inequality. While Marx's labor theory of value builds upon the theories of Smith and Ricardo, it diverges by incorporating concepts of socially necessary labor time, surplus value, and a deeper critique of capitalism's exploitative nature. Now that we have a working understanding of the labor theory of value and the dialectical analysis, we can begin to apply this lens to help us understand whatever we want. In order to analyze the American political duopoly using Marxism, you must first identify where the inherent exploitation in this class system comes from. Within any class system of struggle, there are always two major classes, a minority with all the control and a majority with little to no control, producing the antithesis to democracy. For American politics, there are two major political parties so we focus on those. The Republican Party, which is conservative in its ideology, generally represents, in theory and in practice, private business owners now, the Democratic Party, as far as the 21st century is concerned, is supposed to represent a collectivist left-wing ideology and theory. But in practice, they have had pressures from the way we have changed the hiring process for American representatives. These pressures from lobbyists and campaign contributions have pushed the Democratic Party further to the right, severely limiting the window of legitimate discussion in politics. You can clearly see this right-wing shift play out in my video that exposes the political career of Nancy Pelosi, which you can watch here. Since the Clinton era, topics such as universal health care, which are common-sense solutions in other modern industrialized nations, have been considered taboo in the mainstream. That is by design. We must remember that our representatives are supposed to work for the people, not big corporations. Representatives represent the classes, but aren't necessarily in the classes themselves. These two facts aren't mutually exclusive as the Democratic Party may have the potential to have a publicly funded candidate like Bernie Sanders. And the Republican Party also has that potential. The people agree to pay for the representative's salary through taxes. But this isn't necessarily exploitative because the people are the majority and are hiring to delegate managerial ownership duties of the country to a surrogate, who is supposed to have their loyalty and favor. 
This delegates the power of the majority of the people into the hands of a few representatives, or what we call a representative democracy. Imagine the workers in an enterprise hiring their own managers who are supposed to make decisions based on their better interests. Now imagine those minority of representatives representing themselves instead of the majority. You can begin to apply the Marxist critique when looking at this fucked up class conflict. The group that is normally considered to be the exploited, the employees, which are represented as our elected officials in context, end up being the ones to exploit labor in the form of taxes. If you can imagine our politicians' labor input in the labor theory of value as representation, they input their living labor combined with embodied labor which can be seen as previous established laws and precedent. When combined, these two forms of labor will create the surplus value which are laws passed. You can also see where this exploitation specifically happens. When the representative or corporate class doesn't adhere to the majority will of their constituents on either side of the political spectrum, this is labor exploitation in reverse. And when this lack of proper representation, or as I call it, fair representation happens, we are basically paying these senators to not do their jobs. The contradiction within a political system of classes becomes apparent only when said representation is fixed and not accurately reflecting the popular opinion on a complete ideological spectrum. Being largely limited to two political parties is in itself when the contradiction occurs. It happens when one of these parties of representatives severely limits the scope of popular opinion. Shrinking this Overton window of acceptable politics creates class conflict in the sense that one class, the corporate voter class or those monopolies and oligopolies that participate in the American voting system. The corporate voter class can be comprised of both Democrat and Republican representation but still considered a minority in the context of an entire population, this corporate voter class has a direct conflicting agenda with the worker voter class. This conflict can be thought of similarly in the context of worker rights versus corporate austerity that sees in Marx's analysis on capitalism. Analyzing the voting class struggles of America specifically points out these inherent contradictions and shows how they play out through advocating for policies that may benefit either class. One class is constantly struggling to maintain policies that restrict worker rights to maximize surplus value and minimize wage. The other constantly voting to enact policies that do the opposite. This inherent contradiction of exploiting the people is a direct result of legalized bribery or what Washington calls lobbying and campaign contributions. The contradiction is what leads to bizarre politics where you have two sides often shadow boxing each other yet get nothing done. This is why the Democrats and Republicans may argue on social issues, but largely agree or are only marginally different on economic issues. And the system totters as it encounters a very old contradiction in its current form for which they have no solution. And right now, they don't see a way out, and I don't either, which makes it possible for the first time in my life to begin to see a capitalism that is in fundamental shaking difficulty. And if I were to explain to someone why you get bizarre politics, unlike what we've had for a century, it's because of this. And here in the United States, you see the, the kind of theatrical buffoonery, but there's more to it. Why is Trump such a character in the Republican? Why is that party literally tearing itself apart? Because it can't cope and even the Democratic Party, suddenly confronted with a socialist who isn't marginalized simply because he gives himself the name socialist. In fact, it makes him attractive. This leads to the two parties pretending to fight each other while dancing around the edges of real economic solutions, often stifling popular opinion on real solutions that would be practical for the majority, such as universal health care. Because the role of popular opinion directly contradicts the corporate agenda lobbied for by the minority franchise class. Most people recognize our politicians are corrupt, but to understand we must also ask why. This is the reason for that political theater. It's not surprising. We pretend to have democracy, but lack it economically. Inevitably, those with the wealth and power will use the system to work for themselves. It is why we have characters in politics that often talk in circles, sleaze their way out of answering questions directly, and overall attract psychopathic and pathological liars.
paving the way for other con men like Donald Trump to step in and take advantage of the chaos with false promises and more platitudes. Combine this with a serious media apparatus run by said corporate voter class, and you have yourself a serious problem in the political process. One political party constantly represents individualism and pushing for lack of government intervention, and the other party takes one step to the left and says we will do something marginally different but nothing radical. Fair representation would assume the majority is entirely heard, radical or not. Closing these popular issues out of the process of democratic discourse within Congress restricts the legitimate window of appropriate discussion and alienates the worker voter class from the inevitable false compromise result in policy. Americans whom overwhelmingly support a single-payer healthcare system based on polling aren't hearing this discussion as legitimate within the discourse of our legislative process, which alienates them from their government and their government from them. Yanis Varoufakis is a renowned Marxist economist and former minister of economics in Greece. Known for his expertise in economics, he was hired by Valve, a prominent video game company, to oversee and explore the concept of virtual economies. Varoufakis's role at Valve involved managing the intricate economic systems within games, ensuring a balanced and engaging experience for players. This unique collaboration between a leading Marxian economist and a gaming company highlighted Varoufakis's versatile abilities and the recognition of his expertise beyond traditional economic realms. This led to the development of Team Fortress 2's virtual economy, which allowed players to trade and exchange in-game items, such as hats and weapons, using the game's own currency. The virtual economy gained significant popularity, and players could buy, sell, and trade these virtual items creating a self-sustaining market within the game, all using the ideas from a Marxist. Giannis is also a prominent advocate for economic democracy. He believes in empowering workers and citizens to have a greater say in economic decision-making and challenging the concentration of power in the hands of the state and elite. Giannis teaches economics without capitalism and exposes the truth of how we can have markets without the need for capitalism. I want to begin with a distinction that I already made, and I want to make once more. Capitalism is not markets. Societies always had markets. The Phoenicians had markets, the ancient Greeks had markets. They were not capitalist societies. They were societies with markets. Something happened towards the end of the Middle Ages. There was no labor market. Either you worked for some baron, okay, and if you opposed that social arrangement, your head was removed from your shoulders, okay? Or you never worked because you were the baron. There was no labor market. So the creation of labor markets, of real estate markets, of capital markets, eh, is a very recent phenomenon, and that's capitalism. And perhaps that's a key point to drive home. Slavery had markets. There's nothing unique about capitalism and markets. You remember American slavery? They bought and sold slaves. That's a market. They bought and sold cotton. That's a market. They bought and sold fill in the blank. So markets existed in slave society. Ditto in much of feudalism. Not always. Some parts of feudalism solved the coordination problem in different ways. Not market ways. But markets coexist. So capitalism is not the system of markets because those long predate capitalism. Well, then what is capitalism? I would argue Marx, whose contribution strikes me as pivotal here, had a pretty clear definition that there are different ways human beings have organized the production of goods and services. That's different from how they circulate. Markets are about exchange and circulation. But Marx's focus was on production. So here's three basic ways in modern history. Slaves is one way. You have a master and a slave. Masters is a small group, slaves is a large group, slaves do most of the work, masters tell them what to do, masters become rich and powerful, slaves yearn for a better system. Then we have feudalism. How interesting, different, no slavery, nobody can own anybody. But you have a small group of people again, mm, lords and a large group of people who do all the work, serfs. And one interesting thing is that the serfs yearn to do better. Now we come to capitalism. It's different. And that's what's interesting. How is it different? Nobody is anybody's slave. And nobody has a personal obligation to another person the way a serf 
and a lord did. Instead, a contract links the two. There's an employer, a small group of people who tend to become rich and powerful, and a mass of employees, a large group of people who don't. Notice the parallel in these three systems. You might have thought, if you were all excited about capitalism, you might have believed the theorists of the capitalist revolution that they were breaking from all of the earlier systems. They were breaking from slavery. They were breaking from feudalism. And in important ways, they did. But there were equally important ways in which they didn't. And one of them was this division of people in production into a small group of people with all the power and wealth telling all the others, the vast majority, what to do. A modern capitalist corporation is the most undemocratic institution I can imagine. You do what you are told, the majority. And if you don't, you lose your job and you lose your income. That's called compulsion. And that's the arrangement. And if you don't like what your employer tells you to do, well, you're free in capitalism and you can go and work for another one. Whoa, what an interesting system. Where does all this conversation about freedom come from or democracy for that matter? You know, if you really believed in democracy, the workplace is the first place you would have installed it. You know why? Because that's where adults spend most of their lives, working five out of seven days, the best hours of the day, they're on the job. Make the job democratic if you are believing in democracy, but you don't. You allow the owner or the shareholders or the major shareholders or the board of directors or some mix and match of all of them, a tiny minority to dictate, to dictate to everybody else. Markets without capitalism. My critique of capitalism is that liberal capitalism is no po not possible, never was, never will be. It is just an ideology. In the, it has as much to do with reality as Marxist emancipation theory had to do with the Soviet Union. Zero. If we're going to save markets, because you say, I believe in markets, markets for potatoes. Huh? Have you heard of companies like BlackRock? State Street, hmm? Fidelity. Do you know that they own 90% of the corporations that feature in the Standard & Poor's 500 in the United States? From airlines to JP Morgan to Google. We're talking about two guys. It's guys, it's not girls. Maybe there's a token girl somewhere. They control 90% of capitalism. What is the connection between this and Adam Smith? Zero. As a recent study showed that where airlines compete that belong to the same mega equity firm, when they compete, prices go up by 5% because they collude. Because the CEOs of all these airlines have to report to the same financier. So, this is the point I'm making, that if you really want markets and you don't want central planning, uh, you better do away with the model of capitalism we have because it is centrally planned. There can be no more centralized system than the one we have. So, what would a world look like where markets breathe in the absence of capitalism? Can I do a, I have a dream moment, please? Will you allow me? Every morning, <laughs> about 30 minutes, no matter if I'm off or not, every day. Just kind of get the wrinkles out, crease the arms, make sure the collar is crisp. I'm a worker owner, so I am an employee, but I'm also an owner. Imagine a corporation where there's no boss. You enter, you are hired by a committee, a search committee that go together because they, they wanted an economist, they wanted a graphic designer. So some of them form the committee, they 
Interview 20 people, they hire you. You get one share. Here, a co-op is a, it's a collective of people who democratically and collectively own our operating companies. Everybody has a share, everybody has one vote. And that gives you a vote for everything. You vote for the distribution of the revenues of the firm between research and development, what the basic income should be, and also you vote for bonuses. Not everybody gets the same. For my previous job before coming to work for Evergreen, I couldn't see a beginning and end to it. It was just come do a specific job and go home here. If you do so much work, you could drive up the profit. If, if you have so much profit at the end of your fiscal year, you get a check. It makes me more excited to work because I'm involved. How are you? <laughs> Most jobs wouldn't just share the financials with their employee. Here, as you see it from the top to the bottom. Working in co-ops absolutely changes culture. It changes lives. Because you're sharing profits, you sort of share workload, you share responsibility. Because if you've banned tradable shares, if you reverse the mistake of the British India Company of 1599, and you have one share, one worker, shareholding together with private commercial banking producing money out of thin air, those two combine to create investment banking. Once you have no tradable shares and you have free banking, investment banks have no purpose anymore. Right? Mm. Unless, uh, a car for a car. Just trade. I except that's not really how capitalism works. A car for a car. Right. Because what do we do here? Well, we you know, sell. People need a car and they, they come to us. To buy? No, yeah, well, you said yourself the 2005's in good shape. Yeah, but boss, blue book on that. So we trade. 200. Yeah. Give a car, get a car. Each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. That's in the Bible, right? Why? Why must that be paid? I understand keeping a promise. But people always say that must be paid. Except what if you can't? If you're too poor? you lose your job maybe there's a death in the family isn't the better thing the more humane thing to say that that should be forgiven isn't that who we should be As Yanis Varoufakis once said, the state emerged as a mechanism for regulating class conflict. The state acts as a referee of sorts for a game that has two players, a small group of capitalist business owners and a large group of workers who struggle to own. Now imagine this referee being paid off by the one side due to their obvious disadvantage. The workers have strength in numbers, while the capitalists want to maintain their own numbers, profit numbers, one obvious way that capitalists rig the game is with our system for legally bribing politicians via campaign contributions and lobbying influence. The fact that this is even legal to begin with is telling of a larger conspiracy against the working class. Big corporate donations to political campaigns, something that was largely considered corrupt up until judicial hearings such as Buckley v. Vallejo and Citizens United. Buckley v. Vallejo established that spending money on political campaigns is a form of protected free speech under the First Amendment. This ruling opened the door for increased corporate involvement in campaign financing. 
The Citizens United ruling in 2010 further expanded this by allowing corporations and unions to spend unlimited amounts of money on independent political expenditures. Until the Reagan administration, stock buybacks were strictly regulated and often considered fraudulent business practice. A stock buyback is an option for a company to buy back its own stock. As a result, this artificially inflates the value of stock on the market, misleading potential investors and shareholders' confidence creating a misrepresentation of growth. When you analyze the conflicts of interest within the Reagan administration regarding these changes, you can begin to see the dialectical effects of class struggles playing out into enriching the business. Hey gang, thanks for coming to this month's White House Super Spreader event. I'm gonna keep this tradition going till I'm the last man wheezy. Don't be fooled, people. I won this election fair and square. I don't care what the pundits say, what the papers say, or what the voters say, I'm not giving up. As God is my witness, I will never stop fighting the will of the American people. What has Joe Biden done in 47 years? In just 47 months, I've made this country completely unrecognizable. Look, we've got 200,000 dead, which is way less than I would have predicted back in January when I knew it was coming but didn't say anything. Mr. President, are you willing to condemn white supremacist groups and tell them to stand down? How can I say this in the least horrifying way possible? Stand back and stand by. I mean, await my instructions. I mean, ammo's on sale. I mean, our righteous war is now. Amidst the turmoil and spectacle of Donald Trump's ascent to the presidency, it presents an opportune moment for a Marxian examination of his rise. Blending demagoguery and populist sentiments, Trump tapped into the deep wells of economic inequality, alienation, and the erosion of working-class power. His promise to make America great again resonated with many who felt left behind by a system governed by oligarchs. But here's the punchline. While Trump campaigned as an outsider challenging the establishment, his actions in office revealed a different reality. Rather than disrupting the ruling elites, Trump's presidency perpetuated their dominance. His tax cuts, deregulation, and pro-business agenda turned out to be a scripted performance favoring the wealthy few, widening the chasm between the haves and the have-nots. So as we unpack the Trump phenomenon, remember this. While his antics and bombastic rhetoric grabbed the headlines, the underlying structural issues that prop up the oligarchy remained largely untouched. In the grand theater of American politics, Trump's role may have been headline worthy, but the system's stagehands continued pulling the strings behind the scenes. In other words, while Trump talked a big game about draining the swamp, the swamp remained largely unchanged and the material conditions of the working class continued to disintegrate under his rule. In the twisted tale of Donald Trump's ascent to power, Hidden behind his carefully crafted persona lies a web of failed business ventures, questionable ethics, and shady connection. It is within this context that his rise can be seen as a masterful con, reminiscent of fake populism employed by the likes of Hitler and other autocrats. First, let's take a closer look at his checkered history as a businessman. Trump's track record is littered with bankruptcies and failed ventures, revealing a lack of true entrepreneurial prowess. His notorious casinos, for example, crumbled under financial strain, leaving employees without jobs, investors in the dust and spectators to ponder why such an enterprise faltered, especially considering the house always wins. But it doesn't stop there. Reports of ties to unsavory figures, such as Jeffrey Epstein, raise concerns about potential ethical transgressions and nefarious dealings. While the extent of these connections remains shrouded in mystery, they underscore the blurred lines between big business and Trump's political aspirations. Furthermore, Trump's infamous reputation of not paying his employees highlights his disregard for the working class. Time and again, stories emerge of hardworking individuals left to suffer while Trump walked away unscathed. This callous behavior reveals the true nature of his so-called populism, a convenient facade to exploit the frustrations and dreams of ordinary Americans, charisma, an uncanny ability to read a room, created a cult of personality around him. This aura, combined with his populist rhetoric, seduced millions, blinding them to the hidden deals he made behind closed doors with big business. The stagecraft of his political theater successfully manipulated public sentiment, advancing the interests of the elite while masking the true workings of the oligarchy. As we peel back the layers of Trump's rise, it becomes clear that his path to power was paved with deceit and opportunism, 
The convergence of his unethical business practices, shady connections, and adept manipulation of populist sentiments personify the dark underbelly of the American political oligarchy and the dangers it poses to genuine democratic change. When analyzing the many scams of Donald Trump, patterns become apparent. These patterns are damning evidence as to the intentions and motivations of Trump. Transparent insights into his head. With Trump University, the art of the scam was taught right alongside real estate. Students unwittingly enrolled in a masterclass on being fleeced, as false promises and hefty fees left them feeling like the real estate market's biggest losers. This fine example of educational deception showcased Trump's knack for turning golden dreams into fool's gold. Trump University was a clear scam for several reasons. Firstly, it misled students by promising them access to Donald Trump's real estate secrets and courses taught by hand-picked experts, but instead delivered subpar and generic information. Secondly, the institution employed aggressive sales tactics to persuade students to spend large sums of money on expensive mentorship packages, with some individuals paying up to $35,000. Thirdly, despite claiming to have handpicked instructors, many of the people teaching the courses had no relevant experience or credentials. One of the instructors at Trump University was a former fast food manager with no prior real estate experience. This raised questions about the legitimacy and credibility of the instructors and the quality of education provided by the institution. It further reinforced the notion that Trump University was more interested in making money from its students rather than delivering substantial educational value. Lastly, numerous lawsuits were filed against Trump University, resulting in a $25 million settlement paid by Trump. This exposed the fraudulent nature of the enterprise and further confirmed its status as a scam. Local 10 investigator Bob Norman is digging into the case of a Trump University fraud victim. At Trump University, we teach success going to happen to you. Years before Donald Trump became president of the United States, he was promoting his Trump University, making a lot of promises. I think the biggest step towards success is going to be sign up at Trump University. I think he's a snake oil salesman. I think he's a con artist. Fort Lauderdale attorney Sherry Simpson took the bait, and like thousands of former Trump students and the New York Attorney General's office, she says it was a total fraud. Trump, you wasn't a university, didn't provide any of the, the information that was promised. So it was disgusting to solicit funds from the elderly, to ask people to utilize credit cards, to not to buy a property, but to pay him for the, the, the privilege of learning nothing. Simpson was one of 6,000 victims who settled with Trump for $25 million. Now she's set to get about 15,000 of the $19,000 she lost back, but she wants to turn down that money so she can sue the sitting president individually. I want an apology from Donald Trump. Well, have you ever heard of Donald Trump ever apologizing for anything he's done? No, no, I think I would be the first. At Trump University, we teach success. That's what it's all about, success. It's going to happen to you. These are all people that are hand-picked by me. Terrific people, terrific brains, successful. We are going to have the best of the best. We're gonna teach you what you need to know. We're gonna also make sure, no matter what you do, as I said before, you're going to love it. Because if you don't love it, it's never, ever going to work. Adding insult to injury, graduates were promised a personal photo opportunity with Trump, but were instead subjected to a classic bait-and-switch tactic, posing with a cardboard cutout of the man himself, one of the oldest cons in the book. Moving on to the next con in the Trump playbook. When it comes to taxes, Trump turns fiscal responsibility into a disappearing act worthy of David Blaine. Mysteriously vanishing income, obscure deductions, and a dance with loopholes render his tax returns more puzzling than a Rubik's Cube. It seems he mastered the art of tax code evasion leading to a mountain of unpaid civic duty. For instance, it has been widely reported that Trump frequently used various deductions and loopholes to minimize his taxable income, resulting in significantly lower tax payments compared to his wealth. The exact details of his tax returns remain undisclosed, leading to speculation about the extent of his tax avoidance strategies. 
Furthermore, Trump's refusal to release his tax returns during his presidential campaign broke a long-standing tradition followed by presidential candidates, raising questions about transparency and accountability. These instances collectively point to a pattern of questionable tax practices. Another important aspect to consider is his questionable ethics and alleged connections to organized crime. While Trump likes to project an air of success, his alleged connections to the shadowy realms of organized crime raise some eyebrows higher than his skyscrapers. Though concrete evidence remains elusive, whispers of deals with the wrong partners create a picture of a businessman who doesn't mind breaking the law. Rumor has it that even the most exclusive clubs wouldn't dare compete with the mob connections he allegedly has stashed away. One example involves Trump's former business partner, Felix Sater, who had a criminal past and reported ties to organized crime. Trump collaborated with Sater on several real estate ventures, including the Trump Soho Hotel. Another example is Trump's relationship with Roy Cohn, a lawyer who was known for his connections to mob figures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the other members of this committee. I have agreed to appear before this committee today because I'm guilty. It's all true. I killed them both, just like he said I did. But of course, nobody believes it. And nobody ever will. Because that's how good we are at making things disappear. You think money protects you. You think money makes everything go away, and this bubble that you live in where you just click your fingers and you get what you want. Cohn served as Trump's attorney and mentor for many years. Additionally, Trump has a record of posing as imposters to manipulate property value or public sentiment. There is a well-known incident where Trump used the pseudonym John Barron to contact Forbes magazine in the 1980s, claiming to be Trump's spokesperson. He provided false information about Trump's assets, stating they were worth more than reported, with the intention of boosting his position on the Forbes 400 list. He's somebody that has a lot of options, and frankly, uh, you know, he gets called by everybody. He gets called by everybody in the book in terms of women. Throughout his four years as president of the United States, Donald Trump's presidency was marked by numerous instances where potential conflicts of interest emerged. From his business empire to foreign entanglements, his actions provoked questions about where his personal financial interests intersected with his duties as the nation's leader. In most of these cases, these personal interests would often trump his duties as a leader, pun intended. To understand these conflicts of interest, we must first expose the corruption of his presidency by breaking down the many questionable actions he took. One notable example is the Trump International Hotel in Washington. After Trump assumed the presidency, the hotel became a subject of controversy due to foreign governments, including Saudi Arabia, choosing to hold events and book rooms at the hotel. Reports stating that lobbyists representing the Saudi government had spent large sums of money at the hotel shortly after Trump's inauguration. It was alleged that the Saudi government was overpaying for rooms, meals, and other expenses, benefiting Trump's business. Critics argued that these bookings directly violate the emoluments clause of the U.S. Constitution which prohibits the president from receiving gifts or payments from foreign governments. President Jimmy Carter was notorious for giving up his peanut farm to prevent this exact scenario from happening. Let's now look at Trump's private club, Mar-a-Lago in Florida. Mar-a-Lago also became a source of concern regarding conflicts of interest. In 2017, the initiation fee for Mar-a-Lago doubled to $200,000, which led to questions about potential access and influence that wealthy individuals or foreign nationals may gain by joining the club and having direct access to the president. After all, how many people can actually afford to spend $200,000 just to get a chance at talking to the president? Throughout Trump's presidency, he continued ownership of the Trump Organization, which raised concerns about even more conflicts of interest. The Trump Organization has various international deals and ventures and Trump prioritized these personal financial interests over the best interests of the country. 
the political oligarchy refers to the dominance of the two major parties, the Democrats and Republicans, whom are both bribed by big business and special interests to manipulate the country's political narrative. These parties have a stronghold on political power, often leaving little room for alternative voices and ideologies to thrive. This duopoly's grip on power is evident in the limited representation of third-party candidates in presidential elections. Despite the presence of alternative parties, such as the Green Party or Libertarian Party, they often struggle to garner significant support or media attention, further perpetuating the dominance of the two-party system. The last third-party candidate to win the presidential election and serve as president was Abraham Lincoln. He was elected as the candidate for the Republican Party, which was considered a third party when he won in 1860. Since then, no third-party candidate has won the presidential election. It is important to remember that throughout history, fascist regimes have often used the populism associated with socialism and communism as a means to gain excessive state power. One notable example is the Nazis. Despite labeling themselves as socialists, they targeted and eliminated communists as one of their first actions. In simpler terms, fascists have exploited the appeal of socialist and communist ideas to rally support, but once in power, they swiftly suppress and persecute those very groups. This pattern showcases how fascists manipulate popular sentiments to achieve authoritarian control over the state. Trump's tendency to play on popular policies, such as promoting universal health care when running for office, and then pursuing other interests when elected, align with this fascistic phenomena. During his campaign, Trump made statements indicating that he supported the idea of providing universal health care or ensuring that all Americans would be covered. This kind of populist rhetoric appealed to many voters who were dissatisfied with the complexities and costs of the existing healthcare system. However, once in office, President Trump's policies largely focused on dismantling the ACA rather than expanding coverage or moving towards a universal healthcare system. Despite promises to replace the ACA with a better healthcare plan, the proposed replacement plans put forth by the Trump administration, such as the American Healthcare Act, and the Better Care Reconciliation Act did not guarantee coverage for everyone. These plans did not include provisions for universal health care coverage. On top of this contradiction, the plans could potentially result in fewer people having access to affordable health care, particularly those with pre-existing conditions. While some provisions within the proposed replacement plans aimed to protect individuals with pre-existing conditions, the concern was that the coverage options might not be as comprehensive or affordable as those provided under the ACA. Moreover, without the individual mandate, there were concerns that the plans could disproportionately impact lower-income Americans who might not have access to affordable coverage. In addition to exploiting the populist rhetoric of socialism, fascist regimes, like the Nazis, also relied heavily on the cult of personality. This refers to the worship and glorification of a charismatic leader such as Adolf Hitler in the case of the Nazi. Hitler skillfully crafted a powerful image and effectively manipulated public perception through propaganda, rallies, and mass media. By presenting himself as the embodiment of the nation and its ideals, he garnered unwavering loyalty and support from the masses. Sound familiar? The cult of personality further enabled the Nazis to consolidate their power and suppress dissent as any opposition or critique against Hitler was viewed as an attack on the nation itself. This manipulation of public sentiment, combined with their exploitation of socialist rhetoric, allowed the Nazis to establish and maintain an oppressive and authoritarian regime. Using this lens, we can clearly see a dangerous parallel to the cult of personality that is Donald Trump. Expose on Ron DeSantis. Let's move on to another prominent figure within the Republican Party. Until recently, Ron DeSantis was a rising star within the Republican presidential candidates for 2024. I have left this chapter in because some of this information is still relevant, regardless of the recent developments where Ron dropped out of the race to endorse Trump. However, his ascent to prominence cannot be fully understood without examining the influence of corporate interests and wealthy donors. This connection between power and wealth is a hallmark of the American political oligarchy. DeSantis has received significant financial backing from corporate interests, including major donors from industries such as finance, real estate, and healthcare. These connections provide him with the resources and networks necessary to navigate the political landscape effectively. 
They also act as legal bribes to incentivize Ron to make ridiculous claims about universal health care. Ron believes health care isn't a human right. Why, Ron? That's very Christian of you to say. Especially in the richest country on the planet, while every other modern industrialized nation has some form of universal coverage. He's paid by the healthcare industry for a reason. They didn't just pay him out of kindness. Profit-driven industries make decisions based on profit. They bribed him because they know they can expect him to shut up about popular ideas that will damage their bottom line. And nothing is more damaging to the profit-driven healthcare industry than universal coverage. Insurance companies add no value to your service. In fact, they act as a mafia-style middleman that get between you and your doctor. The dirty little secret of the healthcare industry is that they maximize profits by denying coverage. This is a dangerous and regressive game to play and denotes a larger sense of dystopian trends. In my opinion, there are certain industries that should not be based on profit. A few of these are healthcare, prisons, and education. This directly translates into the American ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I digress. A Marxian analysis uncovers the exploitative practices and worker struggles that often remain hidden within the political oligarchy. DeSantis' policies and stance on labor issues reveal a larger narrative of worker suppression and challenges faced by labor movements. DeSantis has been associated with policies that weaken collective bargaining rights and labor protections. For instance, his support for right-to-work legislation limits workers' ability to form strong unions and negotiate for better wages and working conditions. Through a Marxian analysis, we have explored the labor theory of value, how it applies to the political process for creating laws, and exposed the real reason why political corruption happens under capitalism. By examining specific examples, such as the limited representation of third-party candidates, political connection to corporate interests, and stance on labor issues, we reveal the complexities and implications of the episode. This show serves to unmask the power dynamics, exploitative practices, and enduring influences within the American political system, paving the way for critical discourse and the pursuit of a more equitable and democratic future. In this chapter, we explore how capitalism has insidiously dominated the political landscape, not only in America, but also across the globe. As a pattern of predictable irrationality, capitalism's inherent flaws repeat themselves over and over, enabled by its indoctrinated supporters. By examining historical examples, we will uncover how capitalism's stranglehold on the political system repeats itself, stifling genuine democratic expression and consolidating power in the hands of a few elite. To understand American politics, you have to understand the duopoly dilemma. The American political system is entrapped within the confines of a duopoly, where two dominant political parties consistently push out alternative voices that would change the status quo. This unyielding control by the Democrats and Republicans distorts democracy, empowering the moneyed interests and limiting true political diversity. The capitalist class, possessing immense financial resources, skillfully manipulates the political sphere. Through campaign donations, lobbying, and a revolving door between corporations and government, capitalists have created a privileged space for their interests. Reinforcing the oligarchy's power, and perpetuating a cycle of irrationally predictable inequality. From its inception, capitalism has manifested itself through colonialism and empire building, the exploitation of resources and labor in other nations to serve the interests of dominant capitalist states mirrors the subjugation of the American political system. By applying the dialectical analysis to history, we can understand these irrational patterns and learn how to recognize them. Marx called this historical materialism. The globalization of capitalism further reinforces its grip on politics. Neoliberal policies, promoted by capitalist-dominated international institutions, espouse free trade and deregulation. Such policies often weaken national sovereignty, allowing corporate interests to transcend borders and infiltrate political systems worldwide, sowing the seeds of an oligarchy in multiple democracies. Capitalism's inherent nature leads to the concentration of wealth in the hands of a select few. This accumulation of economic power directly translates into substantial political influence, allowing the capitalist elite to shape policies and laws that primarily benefit them. Perpetuating the oligarchical structure 
and further widening the wealth gap. When you have five individuals who own more wealth than the bottom half of the entire planet, considering money buys political influence, you can begin to see how capitalism reinforces the conditions of its own existence by buying the political process. It is an inherent flaw of the way labor is organized, and it doesn't matter how you change the system, it will always evolve to this late stage. History demonstrates capitalism's effectiveness at co-opting revolutionary movements. By absorbing radical ideas into a capitalist framework, dissent can be mollified and integrated within the boundaries of the system. This process dilutes genuine revolutionary potential, reinforcing the existing oligarchy while creating the illusion of change. An example of this can be seen in the labor movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. During this period, workers' movements, trade unions, and socialist parties emerge with the goal of challenging capitalist exploitation and advocating for workers' rights and better conditions. Where did critics of capitalism, by the way, who called themselves socialists back then, where did they do best? Which state legislature had the most elected socialists of all the 48 states at the time? I won't quiz you. You probably wouldn't guess in a million years. Oklahoma. Socialism in Oklahoma. Lots of it. I bet you there was a lot here in Idaho, too. When the socialists here were in office, they were very practical. They were um, uh, prudent, they were planners. Hohen's vision was so successful that in the 1930s, Milwaukee was regularly rated the best run city in America, the healthiest city in America. People in Milwaukee for most of the 20th century had an extraordinary faith in the possibilities of democratic government to do good. October 29, 1929, Black Tuesday. The New York Stock Exchange is in a panic. In the 1930s, you had a depression. It made the mass of the American working class suffer terribly. And they demanded help. The original New Deal was not one thing. It was a decade-long process and struggle. You're talking about jobs, you're talking about infrastructure, you're talking about inequality. Policies were proposed. The people in the streets demanded more. There was pushback from industry. There was more push from labor. The goal of the New Deal was to say, there are all these people who need relief. We need a sort of federal apparatus which can provide that relief um, and bring the economy out of the depression. They did all kinds of things that socialists typically advocate. They provided a social security system, which we never had before. They provided the first minimum wage. They set up unemployment compensation. They gave public jobs, millions of them, to people who would otherwise have been destitute. They did classical socialist things. That went a long way to change the level of inequality because it helped the people at the bottom. You and you and you and you, you've got a president now. He gave the land a new deal. You hold the cart, now you deal. You and you and you and you put shoulders to the plow. He gave us what we asked for, now pay him back somehow. Franklin Roosevelt, he saw the scorching reality of the Great Depression. He knew he needed ideas. Before he took office, he invites the Socialist Party candidate for president to come talk to him. From socialist perspective, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, the Democratic Party, steals uh, a lot of ideas from the Socialist Party. They prove enormously successful. The problem in capitalism is, so long as you leave that system there, it undoes what can be occasionally achieved, which is why, as a socialist, I can't in good conscience go to the mass of the American people today and say, let's have a big struggle for and then run a, another set of reforms. We've been there. We've done that. That doesn't work. Not that it doesn't work for a while, but it doesn't endure. It doesn't last for us, and it sure as hell isn't there for our children. How is all of this, especially the empire that we live in, directly related to capitalism? Every time a system's in trouble, 
there are the defenders of the system who say, well, yes, I agree, right now it's really crappy, it's dangerous, it doesn't work. But that's because something has come in to destroy the really pure capitalism. If only we had that, it would work beautifully. I understand it. That's a human, you want to hold on because changing systems is frankly scary, always has been. So this is a way you can hold on to a kind of loyalty to capitalism in general while joining in the critique of the way capitalism is here. The answer I would give, which will make these folks unhappy, is look, capitalism is what you got. And if you don't like the way it's evolved, that's very nice. But imagining that you can go back to something pure that won't then repeat the same evolution to what we have, you know, kind of begs the question, how come? We didn't become dependent on the defense industries because a lot of people are crooks or because a lot of people have cronies whom they favor. Come on, that's not really a very profound analysis. There may be cronies all the time, but why were they successful? Capitalist elites responded to these movements by implementing certain reforms and concessions. They introduced labor laws, social welfare programs, and regulations aimed at improving working conditions and providing basic social protections. By doing so, capitalism was able to dilute the demands of the labor movements, appease discontented workers, and maintain the existing capitalist system. This incorporation of labor demands into the capitalist framework often eroded the revolutionary potential of these movements, as they became integrated within the system they sought to challenge, successfully postponing the revolution that always comes from unresolved class conflict. Through a Marxian lens, we have thoroughly examined how capitalism's grip on the American political system is amplified by a recurring pattern of oligarchy formation. Capitalism's influence extends far beyond economic dominance, infusing itself into the very fabric of democracy. However, amidst this seemingly impenetrable framework lies a paradox, the irrational predictability of capitalism's evolution. It is within this paradox that a ray of hope emerges. While capitalism's capture of the political system appears unassailable, its predictable irrationality exposes its vulnerability. The repetition of historical patterns, the concentration of power, and the co-opting of dissent may feel relentless, yet they also demonstrate a consistent fragility that can be challenged. Understanding and exposing the irrational predictability of capitalism's evolution arms us with the vital forbidden knowledge needed to dismantle the existing oligarchy. By refusing to accept the false binaries presented by the duopoly, by demanding accountability from the capitalist class, and by nurturing alternative political voices, we pave the way for transformative change. In wrapping up this analysis, we must acknowledge that our struggle against the American political oligarchy is an ongoing battle. However, armed with the insights gained from a Marxian perspective and an understanding of irrational predictability, we have the intellectual tools to navigate through the haze of false choices and pursue genuine democratic expression. Marxism, like other sciences, seeks to analyze and understand the complexities of social systems. Just as in quantum physics, where the principle as above so below reflects the interconnectedness of particles, this concept can also be applied to social sciences. In the social realm, a society can be viewed as a complex system composed of various classes that interact and influence one another. Much like subatomic particles, social classes have their own internal contradictions. These contradictions arise from the inherent conflicts of interest and power struggles within society. An analogy can be drawn between the concept of entropy in quantum physics and the notion of social entropy within a Marxist framework. Entropy refers to the gradual deterioration of order and the dissipation of energy within a system eventually leading to its collapse or transformation. Similarly, in social systems, internal contradictions and conflicts between different classes create a tendency towards entropy. Just as a subatomic system requires self-sustainability to maintain its structure, a social system also relies on a delicate balance of power and resources for its sustainability. The requirement for self-sustainability in both the social and subatomic realms can be related to the concept of symmetry. Symmetry ensures that forces are balanced and interactions among components occur in an orderly manner. Thus, in both disciplines, a lack of symmetry or an imbalance of power can disrupt the stability and functioning of the system, 
leading to the emergence of contradictions and eventual entropy. In summary, Marxism, like subatomic physics, recognizes the concept as above so below. By applying the understanding of internal contradictions leading to entropy in quantum physics to social sciences, it becomes evident that maintaining a balanced and sustainable system, whether on a subatomic or societal level, requires attention to the inherent conflicts and power dynamics within that system. You don't just go from one system to the next. You have to have a transition or mixed economy of the two. My theory is simple. The goal is to raise awareness about worker cooperatives while simultaneously putting elected officials in office who don't take corporate PAC money. This, combined with a strong worker union movement, could be what is needed for an economic transition. As Senator Sanders says, Real change doesn't happen from the top. Real change only happens from the bottom. In my theory, the conditions for revolution do not arise until both classes implode symmetrically at the same time. This theory is a unique interpretation of Marxism, challenging Marx's understanding of the conditions necessary for revolution, while also making a stunning connection to physics. I propose that while any revolution can arise from an asymmetrical collapse, for a society to become self-sustaining after the revolution, it must undergo a symmetrical implosion where both the ruling and oppressed classes experience material detriment. Similar to how a plasmoid collapsing in on itself creates a self-sustaining ball of energy, you can view my introduction to plasmoid video here. This phenomena can also be applied to the social sciences. By collapsing in a symmetric manner, the theory posits that a revolution can establish a self-sustaining structure that addresses the systemic inequalities and creates a more equitable society. Over time, eliminating class conflict and the requirement for a state entirely, because an egalitarian utopia would not stifle out opposing voices. It is not until both workers and capitalists feel the material conditions regressing together that both can join forces and eliminate the common enemy. When the system fails both sides of the class war is when both sides will see it necessary to replace the system. Class conflict was never going to be won by perpetuating war. It will be won by negotiating peace and revealing empathy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. However, until these requirements are met, all we can do is ensure the conditions. In these new and exciting ways, we can begin to finally connect social science with the concept of, as above so below, patterns of the universe reflecting ubiquitously throughout every field of study like a mirror into the soul of the universe. With the right lens, we can unravel the mysteries of everything. The main problem with American politics can be largely boiled down to censoring, the censoring of popular issues, with the obvious exception of not allowing someone to incite violence. I believe that all ideologies along the spectrum must be equitably represented in a democracy, no matter how radical in order to create an accurate window of legitimate discussion, because the franchise business owner class has successfully bought and paid for our legislative process. This has significantly limited this Overton window of acceptable political discussion. This is why we don't see any debates on capitalism versus socialism going back a hundred years in Congress. Why we have 47 states that have voted to override federal cannabis laws, yet it is still considered federally illegal. It is also why a Princeton University study revealed that the opinions of 90% of Americans have essentially no impact at all. We have the Democratic Party shifting further to the right. The Republican Party is also shifting to the right. Meanwhile, the window of acceptable politics for 90% of regular everyday people is actually outside the window of acceptable politics within our democratic process. This leads to regressive dystopian policies and a stagnation in legislation for workers, which in turn leads to a distrust in our political systems, a distrust in our government, and can pave a way for fascists like Donald Trump. This charming confidence man took advantage of this distrust by conning America like he has done to so many victims. Collateral damage in the spoiled escapades of a bad businessman with a large inheritance, who lied, cheated, and stole his way to the presidency. The man who conned America, the art of the steel, Remember, if you like my content, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button on my videos. Comments and any form of engagement 
dramatically help us break through the YouTube algorithm. I also have a website with research on the Thunderstorm engine, Plasmoid technology and do-it-yourself guides for Malcolm Bendel's retrofit, courtesy of Jordan from Alchemical Science and the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Check out my store for exclusive merchandise along with our forum, where you can post questions, share videos and join in the community to help destigmatize all forms of forbidden knowledge. Don't forget to check out Jordan's channel Alchemical Science and Bob Greenier from the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project YouTube channel. They're on the cutting edge of cold fusion technology.